Thank you, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, you've been welcome, but I welcome you too. And we are sincerely glad to see each one of you here and trust that you'll be blessed. We're going to use the words of the wonderful hymn, Holy, 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 as our opening song, and we'll stand to sing. Let's join together in prayer. And as we do so, our brother Jim Hanley was sharing with me there how his son-in-law Alistair had just returned from a teaching mission trip to Thailand. And he wasn't home that long until he was rushed into hospital. So let's pray for Alistair and Ruth. Uh, I'll include them in our prayer this morning. Father, as we turn to you, we come to the Holy God. We come, O oh Lord, with our own limited view of how holy you are. And yet, dear Father, we appreciate and realize that in light of even mentioning your holiness, we feel our own unworthiness. And we're glad today that we aren't standing trying to present to you our righteousness, which in your sight is only filthy rags. But we stand clothed in the righteousness of the Holy One of Israel, Jesus our wonderful Saviour. And because of this, we dare to approach you this morning. But also, because of this, we are invited to come into your presence and to address you as our Father. We praise you for what Jesus has brought to us. And Lord, as we come before you, we have also been singing, Lord God Almighty. And Father, we come to the Almighty God 
This is important to us because we couldn't save ourselves, but you can save us. And there are many in this meeting today who have been saved and are kept by that almighty power. We thank you also for all that you have revealed yourself to us to be in your word. And we again can only grasp a small measure of this, but we thank you for what we can see, what we can learn. And as we open your word this morning, may we learn even more, and may we be able to add to our knowledge regarding who you are and what you have done for us. Lord, we come as needy as ever. We thank you for all the answers to prayer we have received, but we again find that we have needs upon needs. And as we come, we ask that you'll help us. Help us to have the faith to turn to you and to trust you to meet our needs. Help us, Lord, that we don't make you the last port of call, but the first in our time of need. And Lord, help us to ever be that people who stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Father, we pray for those who can't be here today. Lord, we know that there's a variety of reasons that keep people away. And for some, they're advanced in years and no longer will be able to gather with us. Bless them where they are. Others who are not well, bless them where they are. There are those who have caring responsibilities. Bless them where they are. And so, O oh Lord, you know the needs and we call upon you that you would minister even to those who cannot be here today. Lord, for those of us who are here, you know what we need to hear. You know, O oh Lord, the word that has been brought here today to be delivered. Lord, we pray you'll speak to us. We pray that you will feed us, that we will be edified and strengthened and exhorted through your word. And to that end, we ask the Spirit's blessing upon it. Lord, we thank you for the children and young people who are here. We ask that early in life they will come to know you and trust you. We thank you for those who have come through the Sunday school and the children's organizations in this fellowship. Uh, and we especially thank you for those who have professed an, an interest in baptism. And we can see in them how they were brought up through this fellowship. And we rejoice in this. Lord, we just pray that your good hand will be upon our children upon our families, upon our young couples, and that the enemy will be kept at bay in these dark and evil days. Lord, we reach out to you on behalf of Jim's son-in-law, Alistair, this morning. And Father, we know that whenever something like this happens so suddenly, it just brings such fear and stress into a family situation. We ask that you'll give Alistair a great peace and also Ruth, and they work for you, they minister for you, and you know, O oh Lord, their deep trust in you. But we pray that they might be aware that the healing God is beside them and with them and upholding them today. Bless the whole family, bless Jim. And we ask that they will have little tokens of your grace, even in this time of hospitalization. And we pray that we will be able soon to bring prayers of glory, prayers of thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Lord, as we come again today, we pray for those who have the rule over us. We commit them again to you, and we once again plead that the power of your Spirit would be at work in high places. And Father, not only within this nation, but across our world. And we see, dear Lord, things happening that we never expected to see nor to see happen so quickly or with such ferocity. We never expected to see in the Israel-Gaza conflict such hatred towards the Jewish people from every quarter and on the streets of this city. Lord, we are a people who are ashamed of our unrighteousness, and we confess that before you. We are not a people who have made the Lord our God. And therefore, Father, we come to you and pray for a move of God worldwide, a move of God in the hearts of the wicked. And Father, we know that Israel is not living in obedience to you. They haven't been since the rejection of Jesus. But nevertheless, we can trace your supernatural hand upon them. 
and your keeping power over them. And we come to you, Lord, realizing that you will preserve them, ultimately. But Lord, these are dark days. And we pray, dear Father, that you will help us in observing these things to have the right spiritual attitude and to be able to say, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. For those who we love, who don't know the Lord, we call upon you that you would be merciful. You've been long-suffering, Lord. We pray you would be merciful today. Speak again. Give one more opportunity, we pray. And for those around us in this neighborhood, as they look at world events, may it even open up their hearts and minds to consider that the bridegroom might be at the door. So, Lord, we have brought things before you that are well beyond us, but not beyond you, and our confidence is in you. And we ask these things believing, and in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, boys and girls, you're going to see a picture of somebody on the screen here. I wonder, do you recognize her? No? Any ideas? Will I help you then? No guesses even? Well, I'll start you off. Little Miss... Who said that? Somebody at the back who sees it on the screen. <laughs> little Miss Trouble. Now, I'm having a good look around me. There's a lot of little misses and a lot of little misters in here. Do any of you cause trouble? Hmm? Are any of you a wee bit of trouble? Did you get into trouble this week? No? Oh, you're all been very, very coy. I'll find out later. Don't worry. On the way out, all the... The families will fill me in in your behaviour. Little Miss Trouble. Well, I'm going to tell you the story of Little Miss Trouble and what she got up to. And I'm sure she's not like anybody here, whether you're wee or older. I can't imagine that at all. But maybe you'll see yourself in some of these other characters. Little Miss Trouble wanted to create trouble one day. And she went along to this man. Now, who's this man? He's got a flower pot on his head. He's got different colored gloves and different colored shoes. And you, all you men need to take a look at your socks and see if you've got different colored socks on. No ideas? Mr. Wrong. So she goes along to Mr. Wrong. She's going to make trouble, you see. And she decides to tell Mr. Wrong that the best way to polish his car is with peanut butter. But Mr. Wrong, being Mr. Wrong, he goes in looking for the peanut butter, but he gets it wrong, and he comes out with a jar of car wax and waxes his car with the car wax, and little Miss Trouble is really cross because it didn't go the way she had planned. So she doesn't give up, and that's the thing about these troublemakers. They don't give up. So she goes along and she finds this character. Any ideas? Backward. You tell me I'm backward. <laughs> His feet are definitely going in the wrong direction. But we've already had Mr. Wrong. So this is Mr. Muddle. Mr. Muddle. So little Miss Trouble goes to Mr. Muddle. And she calls him names. I think she says something along the lines of your green face here, or something like that. You know the way you might hear somebody draw attention to our lovely features. They used to call me big ears at school. No idea why. <laughs> That's not the worst thing. They said it was the FA Cup at one time, the <laughs> two handles. And she calls Mr. Muddle names. And Mr. Muddle is cross. He's annoyed. And he goes to say something back, but then he gets all muddled up, and instead of being cross at her, he thanks her. So little Miss Trouble's not having much success, is she? She's out making trouble, and her first two attempts at making trouble have not ended the way she wanted. Well, 
she comes to this girl. Now, there's an action being visualized there. Any ideas who that person might be? She's little, miss. I'm going to have to tell you, aren't I? Late. Now, Monkstown Baptist Church. Can anybody think of any little Miss Lates? <laughs> and I'm not even going to look. I'm not going to <laughs> Little Miss Late. So little Miss Trouble goes to little Miss Late. Well, she doesn't go to her. She goes and lifts the phone at 2 o'clock in the morning. And she says, I'm going to ring little Miss Late and get her wakened up. Who wants a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning? Who would appreciate that? Not too many, I don't think. So Little Miss Trouble lifts the phone, rings Little Miss late at two o'clock in the morning. But Little Miss late was late at getting up that day, and then she was late going to bed. In fact, she still wasn't in bed. She's just standing beside the phone when it rings. And again, Little Miss Trouble wasn't able to create trouble. So why am I telling you this? Well, really, all I want to do is introduce you to all of these characters, because they have their name from what they're like. Trouble, muddled, wrong, late. Because of their nature. You know, from this book, there's a name for every one of us here and everyone who's ever been born, and it's because of our nature. It begins with S. Does anybody know what our name is? Very good. We are sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't meet God's standards, and that makes us sinners. Well, that's our nature. But you know, we don't have to live the rest of our lives without God helping us, because sin will keep us out of, out of heaven, but God can do something for a sinner like you and me. He can do something that will transform us. Here's a few verses I want us to think out of as we look at this wee story. It's found in the book of Job, a great big long book, but I challenge you to sit down and read that today over the, the afternoon. It's hard reading. It's hard going. Sometimes you lose your place and you think, well, who was speaking at that stage and who's speaking now? It's a tough book, but here's a verse in the middle of it. Man, that just means men, women, boys and girls, born for trouble. And that is so true. We live in a world where bad things happen, but we also live in a world where we make mistakes and we get it wrong. And sometimes we actually go out to do things that are wrong. And that's because of the nature that is in us. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. So the answer to this verse is to be born again. And that happens to us whenever we trust Jesus as our Savior. Then we're thinking about getting things wrong. Here's another verse. John 17 and 17, your word is truth. And you know, we can get things wrong. And that's why God gave us his word written down so that we would have it. We could always turn to it. We could always say, it does say that there. God did say that. The Bible says. Because so often, if it was just left up to us, we might get it wrong. And then maybe you're thinking, but it's hard to understand. Well, here's the next verse. To stop us getting muddled, we read this in John 16 and 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And the wonderful thing is, the Lord hasn't left us. When Jesus went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came. And he's at work in this service today. And because he's a spirit, we can't see him. But we know he's here. And that's to keep us from getting muddled. So that when I open the book today and try to teach from it, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me 
to lead me to truth so that I can bring the truth to you. But then we had Little Miss Late. And 2 Corinthians 6 and 2 says this, Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And we've been talking and praying about things that are going on in our world. And we really want you to be ready for when Jesus comes. And there's no better time than now. Will you trust him today? You don't want to be little mister, little mister late, do you? And you don't have to be. Come while you may. And we trust these little thoughts will bless our hearts today and be an encouragement to us. We're going to sing again, and it's a song that asks the question, did you ever talk to God above? And those who want to use Children's Church can do so towards the end of this song. We stand as we sing. Now, we've often gone to the book of Psalms when we're between series, and uh, we won't be picking up another series until I come back from holidays, and maybe even until the new year, because then we'll be hitting the Christmas period, and uh, in a couple of weeks' time, our services will be a wee bit different. On Sunday, the 5th of November, uh, we'll be having the Lord's Table after the morning service, and then the baptismal service will be at night with supper afterwards, so that'll be a wee bit different. And uh, so then after that, you'll be getting rid of me for a couple of Sundays. Uh, so what we're going to do is just continue as the Lord leads, and we're going to look today at Psalm 96, the 96th Psalm. And here we read, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth, sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised, he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heaven. Honour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. 
Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world in righteousness and the people with his truth. One of the rare times in the Old Testament when you get a phrase like that, for he cometh, for he's coming. And here we have it in Psalm 96. Well, it's a, a psalm that is repeated in First Chronicles in chapter 16. There's actually a section there where there are bits out of three psalms. And uh, we find that in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 16. This part is from uh, verse, well, it's the whole thing is verse 8 to 36. And what we find is as a question arising, was it written by David who introduced the psalm on that occasion? Or were these psalms already written and in the Psalter and were they then put together as a kind of order of service for the occasion that is recorded also in 1 Chronicles 16? Because that's a couple of ways of looking at it. Which way around did it come? Uh, were the psalms written first and parts of them selected? Or was it all in one and then it was divided up uh, into the three whenever the Psalter was completed? Uh, well, if it was originating there uh, with that occasion, which was the dedication of the ark when it moved back into the special tent that David had erected in Jerusalem, and if it was there, and if it was the time when David authored the Psalms, the three of them together, then we could put his name to it. But uh, otherwise, there's not a great lot for us to go on. And the other parts that are selected are all quite different. So it's not that helpful for us to dwell too much on that and try to work out which way around it was. But what we do find is this, that there's something interesting about this psalm. Uh, there's no personal testimony in it. There's no complaint. There's no confession of sin. There's no confession of failure on the part of the author. There's no mention of the oppression of enemies. Or there's no recounting past deliverances that God had given, whether personally or to the nation of Israel. There's no prayer either in the psalm, because most of the psalms are prayers. Hear me, O Lord. The Lord heard my cry. There's a lot of praying and asking in the psalms, but not here. Nor is there any thanksgiving, because sometimes it's a mixture of all of those things. You have testimony, complaint, prayer, and thanksgiving. But there's no thanksgiving here either. How often do we not read, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good? But we don't find that here. So it's an interesting psalm for all of those re reasons. And as about, I thought about that, it, it made me think, of course, of many of the psalms that we share with each other. And uh, whenever difficulties come, I'm sure you have your favorite psalm that you would send in a wee text message or in a card to someone who's in need. And I wonder how many folk would send Psalm 96 because we kind of know the ones we usually send and they are sometimes full of prayers and full of the Lord's help and the Lord's deliverance. I just wonder how many times we've ever thought about Psalm 96. But those Psalms that we would share with each other in times of need are quite often ones about expecting God to do things for us. Isn't that really the bottom line? That's why we go to them. They're about us expecting God to do something for us. But here's a psalm that's more about what we should do and what we should do for his glory. And that's the wonderful thing about Psalm 96. Uh, for that reason, the reason of glorifying God, some have called this the millennial psalm because it also mentions, of course, the Lord's coming and, and judgment. But 
uh, in, in, in and through that is woven words like, the Lord reigns, and it's a righteous reign. And then there's the idea of the exhortations including the nations, all the nations, all the families of the peoples, and even the mention of creation rejoicing together. So many have labeled this the millennial psalm, and we can see why. But others have labeled it the missional psalm. And there's probably a bit of both in it. But I can see the missional side, and I want us to concentrate on that today as well, because there's certainly an emphasis on witness, and we're going to take that as a point as we go through the psalm. There's an emphasis on witness. It's not so much about beholding God's glory, which would be the situation in the millennium. It's more about talking about and witnessing to God's glory. So I certainly see this as a missional psalm. Well, it was used in 1 Chronicles 16 by David for the great ceremony that marked the ark coming into Jerusalem. And I think there's a clue there in our understanding of Psalm 96 or how we should look at it. Because it represented the presence of God with his people, Israel. And Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And here was the ark coming into Jerusalem. And here was this great ceremony. And here were all these people being invited. And there's one thing you could attach to, one word that could be attached to the ark of the covenant. It's the word holy. Because it was designed and fitted for not just the holy place, but the holy of holies. It spoke of heavenly realities, and we've done a whole series on that here, so I'm not going to go over that again. And I think the connection with that occasion makes us look back to God's purpose in choosing and electing Israel. Why did God choose them and call them out? Well, they were to be the shop window for the world regarding the glory of God. They were to be holy unto the Lord. Not just the priesthood. Not just the items like the ark. Not just the tabernacle and the temple. The people were to be holy to the, unto the Lord. They were to be different from all other nations. Through them as a nation, God's power would be displayed and his character known. And they were also to be evangelists, making God known to those who were not of the stock of Israel. And the ark was a symbol of God's presence with his people and a reminder on that occasion in 1 Chronicles 16 of God's expectation for his people. Israel, of course, failed miserably and repeatedly. Even Jonah didn't want to go to a Gentile nation. And look at the whole story that is attached to him kicking against God and saying, I'm not going to those Assyrians. So they failed in being evangelists. They failed in being holy. They made all kinds of ungodly alliances and so on. And on and on we could go about that. And here's a psalm that should have reminded Israel on that day of dedication in 1 Chronicles 16 of their high calling by God. Well, like many other psalms, we mentioned this before, it begins with the conclusion or the verdict. You know, whenever we're writing about something and we have a story to tell and there's a punchline, we keep that to the end. But when you come to the book of Psalms, quite often the, the last couple of verses in the book of Psalms are quite flat. And they just seem to tail off and you wonder, is there a bit missing here? And, and that's because for so many of them, they begin with the conclusion. 
They begin with a great declaration, a great statement. And then the rest of the psalm is there to support and to back up the statement that's being made. There are even psalms which are full of the oppression of the enemy and full of dark days that the psalmist went through. But how many of them begin with, I will bless the Lord. So we know the conclusion. We know that it ends well for the psalmist because he begins with that, even though he says, and this is what happened to me, and this is what happened to me, and this is what happened to me. And what we have here is indeed a conclusion, a determination in verse 1, based on the issues that are presented throughout the psalm. And what's that? Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. And that's how the psalm begins. We could stick that verse on at the end and go through the the psalm and then end up with that. Sing unto the Lord and bless his name. So we'll skip dwelling on the conclusion there just for now and we will work our way up to that and we'll keep that for the end as time permits. And what I find as I read through this psalm is that it divides itself up very easily because it's full of exhortations. So we've talked about the things that aren't there, the complaint, the thanksgiving. But what we have are a whole series of exhortations. And again, that fits in with the psalm being missional, being to do with getting the word out to those who need to hear it. And here are some of the exhortations. Well, sing is one. Sing to the Lord. We've already made mention of that. But then we have verse 3, declare, tell, that's witness, isn't it? We, pardon me, we also have ascribe. If you go down, you'll see the word given, the King James in verses 7 and 8. But that's ascribe. Ascribe glory to the Lord. We also have bring an offering, the end of verse 8. We have verse 9, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear, at the end of verse 9, or tremble before him. So we can put those three things together. Bring an offering, worship Tremble before him. We have an approach there, haven't we? Approaching God. And then in the last verses, we just have let. That's maybe one of the hardest things for us to do. Let. Well, let's think of the exhortations in the psalm. First, witness. The end of verse 2. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And then verse verse 10. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. Show forth, declare, proclaim, and say, that's witness, isn't it? And when are we to do this? From day to day. What is the message? The news of his salvation. Now that was the high calling of Israel. They were to do that among the nations, but they failed. And instead of them going into the world with the wonderful truth of the true and only God, To their shame, they brought in other gods and forsook the God who made a covenant with them. Here we are, looking at this psalm and asking ourselves as the church of Jesus Christ, as this local expression of the church, as members of the church, as believers, what's our witness like? Is our witness such that people look at us and and see a holy God, see a people who are different? Do we have any interest at all in showing forth his salvation? And when's the last day we did that? Is it from day to day or is it from decade to decade? What a subject, salvation. Peter says this, 
Whom having not seen you love, that's Jesus, and whom though you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith or the outcome of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should both boast. The salvation is by faith. God has made it so simple for us. It's free. And it's something we can share with the world. We should be showing that forth from day to day. Verse 3, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. You know, we can sing these words, but do we believe them? Do we think that message is worth sharing? Or is it just something that makes us feel good when we come into the house of God? The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Way back in Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, we read this. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God. A mighty, a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. A great statement of fact, isn't it? The Lord is a great God. Now, that's not great in the sense that we often use the word. I'm sure if we use the word great from day to day, we're probably just talking about something that's enjoyable. That was great. We may even think it's something that was excellent. That was great. But when the scriptures mention great, it means immense, transcending. God is not just great in the sense that we understand it. He is the greatest. There are many people in the world down through history who had great attached to their name, Peter the Great. People like Suleiman the Magnificent. You had all these great titles added on. I've just used the word great in another sense there as well. But God is great. It just shows you how limited we are in our, our language. Isn't that right? To express just how wonderful our God is. Well, he's not just the greatest, but he does things that are great. Psalm 136, from verse 3, says this. This is one of the phrases that we find missing in Psalm 96. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders. Wonders are things that uh, we wonder at. There are things that amaze us, things that astound us in life. But what God does are great wonders. Again, there's this idea of transcending all other things that we might wonder at. What God does is above that. It's in a league of its own. We can't get our heads around the wonders that are so great that come from our great God. Oh, we can look at the things that happened when God delivered his people from Egypt. Amazing things. Great things. But we can bring it right down to us today. Because we read this in Numbers 14 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy. I'll tell you, when I look at my life, and my failure, and my sin, and my past, and my regrets. He had to be great in mercy to show mercy to me. And I'm sure there's many here feel the same. But he is great in mercy. That's the wonder. So the greatness of God isn't just about wonder-working displays of power, but it's also the sowing to us his greatness in his interaction with those who he has created. 
Paul in Ephesians 2 says from verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. That's powerful, isn't it? And it takes a great love to love the unlovable, to love those who are his enemies. We might not be able to understand this, but God loves those who hate Israel today. He loves all those who are not his. He loves the world. And this great love. Oh, it would take a great love, wouldn't it? To love the unlovable. And that's the message we have to proclaim. That's what God wants us to share. That's what he wants us to tell. That's what he wants us to declare. And he wants us to be witnesses. So that's an exhortation. Here's another exhortation. Ascribe or give unto the Lord. Give unto the Lord. Ascribe unto the Lord. Or give credit to the Lord for what he has done. And really what we're to do there is to attribute to the Lord that which is rightfully his. Now, how would we understand that? Well, we'll we'll look at a contrast. Because Satan, very cleverly and subtly, manages to get people to attribute unrighteousness to God. Be careful when you look at the scriptures that you don't arrive at those conclusions. Attributing unrighteousness and immorality to God. And Satan at the same time manages to get people to believe that all the good in this world is the product of man's own efforts. Having the right philosophy. The great lie today is that God's laws are harmful and detrimental to human development. That God's commands do nothing but provoke bigotry and intolerance. And that God's ultimate truth is the enemy of inclusion. That's the lie going around today. Because the devil has done a great job of ascribing or attributing evil and hate to God who's described by these three amazing nouns. He is love, he is light, and he is life. And that's not even when we take into consideration the other things that are not nouns, that are adjectives. He is merciful, he is gracious, he is loving So. He is love, light, and life. So here in this exhortation, the psalmist is addressing all the families of nations. But he hasn't left out the way in which the families of nations are to know, and that's through the family of God. We today are the household of faith. We are sons. We are heirs. We are his. We are the Lord's people. We are his witness. But have we got it right in our head who our God is? Are we ascribing to him that which truly belongs to him? Are we aware that we have a God who is love, light, and life? Paul said in Philippians 3 and 10, and this could be our prayer, it should be our prayer, that I might know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, that I might know him. And it's in getting to know him that we will be able to truly and rightly ascribe to him that which is rightfully his. One day, of course, all the families of nations will come to understand the God of the Bible, another reason why uh, many consider this to be a millennial psalm. But we read this in Habakkuk 2 and 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that hasn't happened yet. And we're to ascribe the glory due to his name. Again, we have spent weeks looking at the, the names of the Lord. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Yahweh Yahweh Nissai, the Lord our banner. Shama, the Lord present. Jireh, the Lord provides. Ezra, the Lord who helps. 
Makadesh or Makadesh Kim, the Lord who sanctifies. Rofi, our healer. Rohi, our shepherd. Shalom, our peace. Sitkenu, our righteousness. Gabor Melchama, the Lord mighty in battle. Hosenu, the Lord our maker. Ozi, the Lord our strength. And whenever we get to know the names of the Lord, we can ascribe glory to his name. Knowing what that name means. Knowing what he is. Knowing the truth of who God is. And then we can go to the nations. Then we can, in verse 10, say among the heathen, that's the Gentiles, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. What does that mean? There's nobody higher. That's what it means. God's answerable to no other power. All other powers are answerable to him. The Lord reigns. So we're to witness, we're to ascribe, and we're to approach, we're to bring an offering, worship, and tremble before him. Worship in the beauty of holiness. Come into his courts. That whole idea is of preparing to come before him. wonder, did we do that this morning? Or was it one of those days we just, we like the wee lie in and then it's a mad dash to get to church and maybe some actually didn't make it today? Or did we think about coming? Did we prepare? And you know, it rejoices my heart around the table when uh, folk come and you know they've come prepared. That really rejoices my heart and I know it rejoices the heart of many others. Not prepared to sit in their hands, prepared to bring their offering, prepared to say thank you, Lord. You can tell by the, the choice of the, the words they read and the way they bring and frame their, their own prayers of thanksgiving that they came prepared. I wonder will you come prepared tonight or just leave it up to everybody else? coming into his courts. There were those, of course, who didn't come the right way. We can think of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We can think of Uzzah. They didn't come the right way. They suffered as a consequence, of course. God still takes it seriously that we come to him in the right way. And he wants us to come or to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching and yet it would appear that as we do see the day approaching unless I'm the only one seeing things are moving very quickly and yet it would appear that there's not the appetite to come out to the meetings. The one thing in light of the signs Forsake not, and yet that's the one thing that has been happening, and more and more so, and as I go around churches, this is the thing we're being told. The appetite to meet together is not there. And Jesus is coming. Peter, although he's writing specifically to godly wives in 1 Peter 3, uh, we don't limit it to that. Because here's what he talks about. It's not about worshipping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. is literally translated worship the Lord in holy garments. But here's what Peter writes about godly wives adorning. Let it not be that of the outward adorning, but in the putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. That's definitely not something you limit just to godly wives. <coughs> I wonder, did we adorn the inner man before we came to the house of God today? Before we worked for God any day? Before we witnessed for God? I wonder, do we still tremble? We sang this morning, holy, holy, holy. I wonder, was there anybody who felt the impact of that as we sang it this morning? Or was it just one of those lovely songs that we sing well in Monkstown? 
an exhortation to witness, to ascribe, to approach. And then we have this word, let. And I like this word because you can kind of rest in the word let. Somebody says, let that be, you just let it be. Let go. You let go. It's a great wee word, let. And here we find something that's it's not up to us. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. It's, it's all about creation. And there's coming a day when we'll just be able to say, let that happen. Let that take its course. Let God work this out. There will come a day when even creation will know the touch of the Lord when he comes. And I believe Paul mentions this in Romans 8. And from verse 19 we read, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole crea creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. There's a line of a chorus of a song came into my mind as I thought about that. We who have a longing, who have an expectation, even creation unknown to us has built into them this longing. And the wee line is this, what a day that will be. There's coming a day when no heartaches will come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. What a day that will be. Even creation is waiting. And all we have to do is let. Because it's happening. It's going to happen. It's going to come. What an amazing redemption we have. And because of all of this, and there's bits I've left out for time, we can then go back to the first verse. The conclusion, if you like. Sing. Sing. Sing a new song. Why new? Well, when you go to Revelation 5 and 9, you read of a new song there, but it's not a song that's new in a sense, because we sing in our hymns unto him who has loved us and washed us from our sins. So it's not new in that sense, but the context is new. The situation is new. The place will be new. And we're singing Psalm 96 today in a different era and dispensation completely to those of David's day. So it's a new song in that sense. It should come to us with newness until we do sing the new song one day around his throne. Oh, we won't be standing around the Ark of the Covenant. That's only a picture. We won't be in the Holy of Holies in a, a reconstructed temple. They're only pictures of, of the reality that there is a Holy of Holies where God dwells and where God is. And where all the symbols that are pictured in the tabernacle and tam temple items are realities. It's there that we'll sing the new song. That'd be wonderful. Ah, but we can still sing here. And that's the wonder of God's salvation. In our darkest days, we can still sing here. May the Lord bless these thoughts to our hearts. A lovely song to end with. Behold our God. Thank you for choosing that, Andrea. It's very appropriate and we stand as we sing.
sing unto the Lord, our great God. The Lord reigns. Let even creation rejoice. Father, help us today to be those who truthfully ascribe to you what is truly yours. And help us, Lord, to take these exhortations to witness, to declare, to approach you, to take them to heart in the day that where you have placed us. And help us to reach out to those in darkness. Help us not to point to the failure of Israel. Help us to look at our own failure and to do something about it. For Jesus' sake. Amen.